Welcome to the 2021 Catholic Days at the Capitol. Over the next two days, you will hear from Florida bishops and from experts on policy priorities of the Catholic Church in Florida. Also, see Representative Aaron Grawl receive the Defensor Vitae Award and enter into prayer, first with the Rosary and later with the Red Mass of the Holy Spirit. And now, here is your host for the day, the Executive Director of the Florida Conference of Catholic Bishops, Michael Sheedy. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Michael Sheedy. I serve as the Executive Director of the Florida Conference of Catholic Bishops. It's my great pleasure to call it 2021 Catholic Days at the Capitol to order. Now, with the exigencies of the current COVID-19 pandemic, these Catholic Days are taking place remotely or virtually for the first time. Thank you for joining us, and we give thanks for the technologies that enable us to convene in this way while concerns for health and safety would otherwise keep us apart. Now, it's our tradition to reverence our beginnings with prayer. And so please join me in welcoming Bishop William Walk of the Diocese of Pensacola, Tallahassee, where our state capital and the Florida Bishops' Conference are located, for a word of welcome and to offer our opening prayer. Hello, I'm Bishop Bill Walk of the Diocese of Pensacola, Tallahassee. On behalf of my brother bishops here in the state of Florida, welcome to Catholic Days at the Capitol. It is good and important that we gather like this. Now, normally we gather in person, and that's preferred, of course, and we hope to do that again next year and in the future. But this year we gather virtually. It's important for us to gather however we do because we need to support one another. We need to remind each other that we are a community of faith and a community that doesn't just pray together, but we work together and we work for justice together. It's also good for our legislators to see us as a community coming together, to be reminded that we make up a good part of the electorate. We are voters, we are citizens, and we care deeply about the direction of our state and our country. And so over these two days, we will gather to to listen to some, some talks. We will gather to learn about the issues that are important to us. And some of us, many of us, will also advocate for these issues with some of our legislators and their offices. And again, it's good for us to do that, to let them know this is what we hope for, this is what we expect, this is what we want in our state and for our society, for our country. And so it's good for us to do that. So we'll be doing that. We'll also gather to pray. At the end of this, we'll, have, we'll celebrate a mass. We call it the Red Mass for legislators. A few of us will be able to gather in person in the Co-Cathedral in Tallahassee, but everyone will be invited to be part of that through, um, through, the, on, on, through the internet. You can join us and pray with us as well. But all of this is in the context of our faith. We are people who, not, we don't just gather to pray in churches like this, but we gather also to advocate for justice and peace for our state, our country, our world. Let us pray. O oh, good and gracious God, we are your beloved children gathered from all over to do your will, to promote justice and peace, to work and live and promote our faith in the world. Bless us, bless all of our efforts today and tomorrow and throughout our lives, so that your will be done in our life, so that you be glorified in everything we do, and our brothers and sisters may be lifted up. Bless all of our efforts, which we hope and pray are yours. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Catholic Days at the Capitol is an event that began decades ago, and it's taken on different formats and different agendas. And this year, we certainly have a different format but it has maintained the goal of providing an opportunity for Catholics across Florida to engage on issues of concern to the church with our legislators. It's our privilege to draw you into the work and the mission of the Bishop's Conference. For those who are not familiar with the conference, and as a good review for those who are, we serve as liaison to state government on matters of concern to the church among Florida's seven dioceses, known in church speak as the province of Miami as a nonpartisan public policy voice of the Catholic Bishops of Florida, who serve as our Board of Directors. It's a very prominent aspect of our vision to provide Catholics in Florida with these opportunities to engage with lawmakers. Now, the Florida Legislature is among the many institutions of our society 
impacted by the pandemic. Just as our parishes and schools have made changes to the ways that we normally come together, so has the legislature. With the goal of ensuring the safety of legislators and the public, a number of changes have, have gone into effect and are under continual review. Things may change again, but as we pull this briefing together, Senate committees are taking place with only members, staff, and invited guests present. Those who wish to provide testimony may do so from the Le Tallahassee Leon County Civic Center, where we normally gather for Catholic days. House committee meetings are generally open, but with very limited attendance. And many, but not all, legislators are only taking conference call and Zoom or Zoom-like meetings with constituents and stakeholders. Know that in this environment, our goal in this briefing is to prepare you for meeting with your legislators in whatever way you can, virtually, over the phone, or possibly in person while they're at home in their districts. In whatever ways you and they are able to meet, we want you prepared to do so on respect life, health, and education legislation. These are the three areas in which we will focus today. A link to a more comprehensive list of our public policy priorities is available on our public policy priorities document available on our website. Many of you participated in Catholic Days last year. I want to offer a brief update on the issues that we took up then. On the abortion front, we sought to enact a requirement for parental consent before a child undergoes an abortion. Florida restored that common sense measure last year. The law is now in effect and has not been challenged. This is a key success as a previous court ruling invalidated a similar one over 30 years ago. On assisted suicide, recall that we had a bill filed to repeal the prohibition against assisting in self-murder. Thankfully, that bill did not advance. Thank you to those who contacted their legislators to express concerns about it. Finally, the death penalty repeal bills did not advance, but we've now gone 17 months without an execution and will continue this year to advocate for this legislation. You'll hear more about this later in our program. Now this year, we are prepared to brief you as we have in years past. The associates of the conference and I will discuss our priority issues. We have sheets to which you can refer as you prepare to speak and communicate with your legislators. We realize you may have questions as we get into this discussion. So perhaps most importantly, the background sheets are available on the Catholic Days participant page of our website. A link to the web page was emailed to you where you can find the background sheets and other materials. So after this presentation concludes, we will hold an interactive question and answer session on Zoom where you can type in your questions. A link to the Zoom meeting will be pasted below and is available on the Catholic Days participant web page. Thank you again for joining us for 2021's Catholic Days at the Capitol. We're prepared to highlight four bills in three different areas, respect for human life and dignity, health care, and education. So without further ado, let's start talking about our priority issues in this remote or virtual way. Thank you again for joining us. Let's keep talking about our priority issues now with our associates. And to begin, I'm pleased to introduce to you Ingrid Delgado, our longtime Associate Director for Respect Life and Social Concerns. She's got the lead on our Respect Life issues this year, um, and we're going to be focusing on two areas. One is limiting the harm of abortion, um, and the other will be ending the use of the death penalty here in Florida. Now, Ingrid, in your role as our lead staff person on both limiting the harms of abortion and on the death penalty, you get to hear some interesting observations from legislators. Uh, why don't you share with the participants some of what you hear? Sure, I do. So, of course, we as Catholics are pro-life for the whole life. And I hear from members of both major parties all the time how, even though they don't agree with us on every issue, they do admire our consistency for advocating for all life in all of its stages. So speaking about both of these issues, this session as one broader concern for life, um, number one accurately represents the fullness of our beliefs and will hopefully invite members to think about these issues as connected rather than as distinct since they both have to do with the intentional termination of life. Mm -hmm. So maybe building on last session's uh, success in, in reinstituting the requirement that a a minor received parental consent prior to undergoing an abortion. Uh, we do want to focus a bit on abortion first, I think. Um, 
In this interim, you've identified a lot of concerns with our current regulatory framework here in Florida that relates to abortion. Um, what are some of the things that, that we've identified as concerns? Sure. So if I could, I'd like to highlight four things. And one, doctor's offices that perform abortion are not required to be licensed as an abortion facility if um, it is not their primary function. So basically, if less than 50% of their services are abortion, they are not licensed as an abortion clinic and they are not regulated as an abortion clinic. Um, also, third trimester abortions are prohibited except for to save the life of the mother. But we have noticed on the Agency for Healthcare Administration website that there were some third trimester abortions reported for other reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, number three, abortion in Florida is prohibited after a child is viable, but there doesn't seem to be any clear guidance for inspectors to go in to determine that that happened. And number four, Florida requires that um, for an infant born alive during abortion, that that child is then treated as the patient and immediately transported to a hospital. But there is no evidence that um, inspectors are ensuring that viability testing took place ahead of that one, and two, we don't have any follow-up information on the charts to see what happened with that child once transported to the mm -hmm. hospital. Yeah, that ban on abortion after viability um, seems to be not so much of a, a strong marker in, in statute. It's, it's not real clear that it's being as effective as we like, and in fact, uh, there are some concerns about more late-term abortions happening in Florida, something of a late-term abortion problem. Uh, I'd like to say a little bit more about that. Sure. So I think an alternative to our concerns with viability is maybe establishing like a hard line in gestation when abortions would be prohibited. And so looking at some of the work in other states, um, there are bills in effect prohibiting abortion after 20 weeks gestation. And there's research showing that at that stage, um, unborn children may have the capacity um, to feel pain. And so passing such a bill in Florida would be significant because just in 2019, there were over 900 children aborted after 20 weeks gestation. Mm -hmm. Now, as, as you deal with legislators and as participants in Catholic Days interact with legislators, they might hear some objections to, to these proposals. I think one of them might have to do with the fact that um, these laws are already in effect. Can't we just trust our regulatory agency to, to do something with this? Right. And so in regards to the regulatory piece, you know, it's perfectly appropriate for the legislature to direct the agency if these laws aren't being regulated the way that the legislature expected it to be. And with respect to the perhaps the ban beginning at 20 weeks uh, rather than being at viability or being in law at both viability and 20 weeks, uh, some members have concerns that that might uh, go beyond the current federally constitutional prohibited or permitted abortions and infringe on a woman's right to choose an abortion. Uh, what's a good response to that, or what, how do we respond to that? So I would say that last year on the parental consent bill, we saw that there was bipartisan support there. So I would hope that we can see bipartisan support here as well, where members of both major parties, even those who consider themselves pro-choice, can agree that prohibiting abortion when a child has the capacity to feel pain is appropriate. And also, you know, these uh, laws are in place in other states, and actually the U.S. Supreme Court has not specifically um, addressed this issue just yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, good. Well, Ingrid, that's a great overview to where we are right now with respect to uh, planning for the session, looking at ways to limit the harms of abortion, to strengthen the existing laws that are already in effect, um, as we hope to make abortion not just, you know, make, really we hope to make abortion unthinkable. So um, thanks for that good insight on that stuff. And we're going to shift to the death penalty, right? Now, shifting now to our discussion of Florida's death penalty and work to repeal the death penalty, Ingrid, it might be helpful if you just highlight really what the state of things is here in Florida with respect to executions to the death penalty. Absolutely. So Florida is a national outlier when it comes to the death penalty. Florida has exonerated more people off of death row than any other state. We're at 30 death row exonerees. Florida maintains the second most populous death row in the country. And we imposed the highest number of death sentences last year. However, at the same time, um, Florida is moving away from its use of the death penalty. Thankfully, there were no executions in 2020. And also, public opi opinion polling continues to show an increase in support for alternatives to capital punishment. Mm -hmm. Good. Now, I think people have a good understanding of the church's opposition to abortion, but may not be as clear about our teaching around the death penalty. Why don't you say a bit more about that? 
Sure. So in 2018, Pope Francis directed that the Catechism of the Catholic Church be revised to instruct that the death penalty is inadmissible. And it's important to note here that the church didn't change its position, right? So St. John Paul II and Pope Benedict and St. Augustine have all said that the death penalty really should be rare and is only appropriate if it's the only way by which to keep society safe. So what has changed is the penal system, right, that has so much improved that it is now unnecessary to execute in order to keep society safe. Mm -hmm. Now, tell us a bit more about the bills that are proposed this year that would repeal the death penalty. Sure. So these bills would delete provisions in statute allowing for capital punishment. And in current law, if someone is convicted of first degree murder, the only two sentences on the table are a sentence of death or a sentence of life without the possibility of parole. And life without parole in Florida really means life without parole, right? Florida abolished parole decades ago. So what would happen is that um, the default sentence for first degree murder would be life without the possibility of parole. Mm -hmm. Now, as we take up this bill again as a priority, you know, uh, participants in Catholic Days have heard that this bill did not move, did not advance last year. Uh, what would you like to say about its chances for moving and advancing and reaching passage this year? So it is unlikely that it will be passed this year, but it's important to think about these issues from the long-term view, right? On parental consent prior to a minor's abortion. We worked on that issue for 30 years. Waiting period prior to abortion. We worked on that issue for 20 years. So there is a significant value to educating members um, about these issues and elevate their interest. And you know, demonstrating public bipartisan support would be, you know, a step in the right direction. So rather than asking members this session to vote yes or vote no on this bill, since they won't have the opportunity to do that, um, maybe we can ask them to co-sponsor the bill. And Catholic Days participants last year did the same thing. And actually over 20 House members did end up co-sponsoring that bill. Now, those were all Democrats. Um, so and not to put you on the spot or anything, but what do you think about offering a prize to the first CDAC participant this year that can get a Republican co-sponsor? I think we can do something about that. I think we should have a prize for that. It's a great idea. Ingrid, thanks. Now, I know uh, as you and as our Catholic Days participants interact with legislators, some of them tend to think that um, some, there's something good in the death penalty and that it gives some closure to victims' families. That's really not the case, is it? Right. So we hear over and over again from murder victims, family members who share publicly that um, rather than provide closure, the years of litigation and uncertainty actually exacerbates their grief. I think it's also a misunderstanding that people have that uh, the death penalty is going to be less expensive than the alternative of life without parole. Right. In reality, um, capital punishment costs the state millions of dollars more than it would if all those death sentences were commuted to life without parole sentences. And I know a lot of folks have got questions about the deterrent effect of the death penalty. Um, what do studies show about that? So there is no evidence that demonstrates that capital punishment is a deterrent. In fact, the states and regions with capital punishment have higher rates of crime, and the states and regions without capital punishment have lower rates of crime. I'd rather be in a state with lower rates of crime, personally. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. Well, hey, Ingrid. It's been great talking to you about these two Respect Life proposals that we're going to be focusing on this year. First, to limit the harm of abortion and enforce our existing laws a bit better, and also to end the use of the death penalty. Uh, it's going to be really important. These are hugely important topics for us, for Catholic Days participants. Um, and so thank you for all that you've shared with us today. Well, ladies and gentlemen, here for his second Catholic Days at the Capitol is our Associate for Health, Ken Kniepman. Ken's going to take the lead in explaining our health care priority issue for this Catholic Days. Ken, glad to have you back. It's good to be here, Michael. Well, Ken, uh, this has been quite a challenging year uh, for the health ministries with whom you interact, the hospitals, nursing homes, and others um, responding to the needs in this pandemic, uh, caring for sicker patients, supply shortages, staffing shortages. Uh, you've done a lot of great work supporting their important work and keeping us all healthy and safe. So thank you for that. Now, as we look into Catholic Days this year, though, we're going to talk about an issue that uh, really is going to transcend just this pandemic. It's going to have importance uh, well beyond it as we look to promote and support the Medical Ethics and Diversity Act, or the MED Act, uh, which will strengthen and expand conscience protections for healthcare workers. So, Ken, maybe to start our conversation, uh, 
conscience is really pretty important uh, for healthcare workers, but also for everybody. Really, I think we Catholics have a unique perspective on the importance of Catholics. Maybe you could start by saying a bit about that. Sure, and, and certainly that's a true statement that for as Catholics, that conscience is a very important thing. And if we look to the to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, we really see that. Just a simple word search of the Catechism will return over eighty references from the Catechism on that single word. And there's an entire section in the Catechism around moral conscience. And just to paraphrase a couple of things from the Catechism, the Catechism tells us that conscience is what allows us to both discover and to know the divine law. It enjoins us to do good and to avoid evil, and it bears witness to the truth in reference to God. The Catechism specifically says that when he, meaning us, when someone listens to their conscience, the prudent man can actually hear God speaking. St. John Henry Newman, who was recently canonized, is quoted in the Catechism, and he describes conscience as the messenger in both grace and nature that speaks to us from behind the veil. Neat stuff. Well, uh, what are conscience protections in healthcare? Well, Michael, conscience protections in healthcare are there to protect workers and, in many cases, entities from participating in activities that, would, that they would object to on moral or religious grounds. There are conscience protections in both federal and state law, and in Florida, those protections exist around abortion, sterilization, contraception, the death penalty, and end of life. Now, since we already have some of these protections in law, why is this bill needed this year? That's a great question, and, and I think there's, um, there are a couple of things for us to look at. Um, first of all, when we look at those existing protections, those were really responses to specific situations. The Med Act is a broader health care bill, and it's more proactive in nature. It applies a framework of conscience protections to any potentially morally offensive activity. Additionally, those conscience protections actually encourage people to become health care workers. A sizable percentage of healthcare workers encounter discrimination because of their moral beliefs, even as they're going through their educational process. So nobody's going to want to be an obstetrician gynecologist if part of their training requires them to participate, say, in abortion. Um, at least no faithful Catholic uh, would want to do that kind of thing. Wow. Well, uh, what are some other areas uh, today that really need conscious protection, need shoring up? Well, certainly, if we just take a minute to think about it, we know the pace of scientific development in many cases is outpacing the thoughtful consideration of those developments. In an increasingly secular culture, moral and ethical considerations are measured differently, and sadly, in some cases, not at all. Some examples of this would be dispensing marijuana or other mind-altering drugs, gene editing on children in utero, fertility clinics, or gender identity interventions that remove healthy organs from bodies or introduce radical off-label hormone regimens. Wow. Okay. So th clearly that, this bill is going to be needed. I know that our Catholic Days participants are going to be interacting with legislators, many of them, and there are some objections that often arise when we talk about conscience protections. I think the biggest one, the most prominent one, really, is that... Uh, Conscience clauses simply are, are giving people the license to refuse to provide needed or important care. They get characterized as refusal clauses. That's really not a very apt description of, of conscience protections, really, is it? No, Michael, it really isn't. And, and this bill simply protects providers from having to perform specific procedures that they object to morally. To explain this a little bit further, in law, conscience protections do not apply to the realm of emergency treatments. So those things that would be life-saving or would save you from imminent or, or severe physical harm. Conscience protections simply involve what we would consider lifestyle and elective procedures. So really, it's going to uphold people's ethical beliefs while people can continue to 
uh, look to other providers to provide care that, that they might otherwise seek or desire. Mm -hmm. All right, but it pre preserves a person's sense of ethics and, and respect for others um, in an important way that we really seem, seem to need today. Well, Ken, thank you very much for the description of the bill, for walking us through that. Um, hopefully it's giving our Catholic Days participants a really good understanding for this bill as they prepare to speak to legislators about it. So thank you again, Ken, uh, and thank you all. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to introduce to you um, Mike Barrett, who is our education associate here at the conference. Mike is participating in Catholic Days for the first time as a member of our staff. Uh, he joined our staff here in Tallahassee after serving in a local law firm for several years. Uh, prior to his legal studies at Notre Dame, Mike was also a teacher and a coach at a high school in Jacksonville. Now, the conference supports uh, a strong system of public schools and also parental choice in education. That's an area of priority and an area of focus for a long time. This year, we're going to focus on uh, strengthening and streamlining these educational choice programs here in Florida. So Mike, glad to have you with us today. Great to be here, Michael. Thanks for having me. Okay. Now, as we do support a uh, really strong public school system and also parental choice in education, mm -hmm. um, the church has got a lot of really pertinent thinking uh, in terms of a parent's role in education, but also the role of the community. Mm -hmm. I want to just start off by sharing some of those insights from, from the church's teachings. Sure, absolutely. So the church teaches that parents are the primary educators of their children. Family is the first place where students learn to read, but also learn who Jesus is, who they are. Um, so intellectual, emotional, and spiritual formation starts with the family. And so parents are the primary educators of their children, um, but parents can't do it alone. They need society. And so the family, the church, and various levels of state and local government and federal government have their appropriate roles in implementing and important, imparting education policy. So this means that the state should protect a student's right to an education. Um, and what this means and what the church actually says is that no segment of society should have what's called a school monopoly. And so parents, since they're the primary educators of their children, should have a real choice as to what's the best option for their student. Where will they learn best? Where will they flourish as a human? And this can be in Catholic schools, public schools, charter schools, homeschool programs, um, other non-religious private schools. The, the important point though is that parents have a real choice as to where their students are educated. So recognizing the importance of parental choice in education, it's fair to say that Florida is really leading the country in a lot of its programs. Um, Maybe for the participants in Catholic Days, it'd be good just to talk about the landscape that we have currently in Florida. Sure. So Florida is definitely on the cutting edge of school choice. Um, and um, has, Florida has six different state scholarship programs that are really robust. Um, the scholarship pro those scholarship programs fall into three different categories. So first, you have income-based scholarships. So if a family... Um, has a household income that meets a certain threshold or is below a certain threshold, um, then students can apply and qualify for those scholarships. Um, the second category is special needs based scholarships. And so students who are diagnosed with various disabilities, whether they be learning disabilities like dyslexia or um, physical disability like Down syndrome, um, or things like that, uh, students can apply for those scholarships and receive scholarships based on um, their, their special needs. Um, and then finally, there's the voluntary pre-kindergarten program, which is offered to everybody regardless of income or disability um, for students uh, who are four years old. So it's a free year of free school um, for anyone who applies. Okay. Now, uh, for many years, there was always some concern in the educational realm here in Florida that a provision of the state constitution might prohibit uh, the use of state funds or state general revenue funds from being transferred to religious institutions like religious mm -hmm. schools or Catholic schools. Mm -hmm. uh, that's been known as our Blaine Amendment. A lot of our longtime Catholic Days participants have heard us talk about the Blaine Amendment over the years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But really, some things have changed you know, in our landscape, the legal landscape, um, not just in Florida, but really at the national level that makes that a little bit less of an issue these days. 
That's right. That's right. So, yeah, I think the first thing to remember about these state scholarship programs is that the that families apply for the scholarship funds, and then the funds are distributed to the families, and the families get to decide where they spend those state scholarship funds. Um, and this past summer, uh, the Supreme Court decided a case called Espinoza versus the Montana Department of Education. And in that case, the Supreme Court um, decided that uh, if a state has school choice programs, like the programs in Florida, um, a state cannot exclude religious schools from that program just because they are religious. Um, so uh, doing so is actually a violation of the parents' um, free exercise of religion rights under the First Amendment. And so basically the court decided that if you're going to have school choice programs at all, you have to include both um, secular private schools and religious private schools, and you can't discriminate based on, on religion. Well, it's nice to be finally living in a post-Blaine era, you know, here in Florida. That's right. That's really good. <laughs> well, um, you know, the legislature is convening. Um, they're the ones who are looking at streamlining and strengthening these programs. How would you describe the changes that they're contemplating uh, in this session? Sure. So I think one of the big ways uh, that the scholarship pro programs can be streamlined and, and improved is by converting the st scholarship programs to what are called education savings accounts or ESAs. And these are basically um, accounts that are set up for families so that when they receive the scholarship funds, the funds can go into an actual account and then the family can take out the money and use the money for what are called appropriate uses of funds. And there's a long list of appropriate uses of funds. Uh, obviously, that'll include costs and tuition to a, an eligible private school, um, but it also includes instructional materials, curriculum, different post-secondary programs that a, that a parent could enroll their student in, um, specialized summer programs, um, after-school programs, uh, a various, um, a, it's, it's a wide breadth of, of, of educational uses that um, a parent can can uh, employ those funds for their student. I was particularly impressed that one of the other possible changes might include some of the eligibility requirements, such as uh, doing away with the requirement that a student attend a public school prior to receiving a scholarship that could be used someplace else. I think of children who um, maybe attend a Catholic school, mm -hmm. who have really good teachers who are on the ball, who recognize a learning disability early on. Mm -hmm. Um, but in order to qualify for a scholarship, you know, that child would have to currently leave that Catholic school, spend a year in a, in a public school mm -hmm. before they become eligible for that scholarship. I think that's one of the things that they're talking about uh, removing as well. That's right. That's right. So we're very hopeful that um, for that would be the McKay scholarship and the Family Empowerment Scholarship still have that requirement. And so we're really hopeful that that requirement gets removed to expand access to, for all private school students to be able to qualify for that scholarship. Okay, well, good. Good deal. Well, I know that uh, you know people who are participating in Catholic Days, as they talk about this with legislators, um, there's a lot of support for this in the legislature. It's bipartisan, but still, there are folks who hold out who would contend that by uh, funding or providing these state scholarship programs, uh, we're hurting public education in some way. We're, de we're removing funds that would otherwise support public education um, taken away from those schools. Um, but there's a pretty good response to that. There is. I think that um, one, of the key, um, one of the key things to note about that is that the scholarship amounts are linked to what's called the Florida Education Finance Program, which is a special per-pupil funding calculation. And um, the thing, the important thing about that is the FEFP is not, it's not 100% of the per pupil funding for um, education in Florida. And so what that means is the scholarship, it's actually cheaper to fund a scholarship than it is to fund the same student going to a public school. So it saves the taxpayers money. Um, in Catholic schools alone this year, um, Based on that calculation, uh, Catholic school students on scholarships have saved the state of Florida over $200 million. 
So I think that's an important thing to note is that um, it's actually cheaper to have students beyond these scholarship programs. And then if it's a per pupil expenditure, the, the funding will be the same based on, it's going to be based on the number of kids in a school rather than um, just an overall number or an amount of funding that's available. Right, that's right. So Florida's education funding is based on students. So funding is per pupil. So if that student leaves the public school, then the school doesn't need the funding for that student. So the school is no worse off. Okay. Well, good. Well, good stuff, Mike. Well, uh, you know, we're proud to be Floridians. We're proud of where our state is in terms of promoting educational choice. Uh, we look forward this session uh, to seeing those programs strengthened, to see them streamlined so that they can better serve Floridians and really pave the way for the rest of the country. So uh, we're glad that folks will be participating uh, in, in that effort uh, through Catholic Days at the Capitol. And I want to thank you again, Mike. Thanks for being here today uh, and thanks for, for joining the staff at the conference. Glad to have you. Well, I do want to thank the associates for their outstanding overviews to the issues that we'll be engaging on this year. And in just a few moments, Bishop Noonan will close this segment of Catholic Days in prayer. You're invited to join us for a question and answer session and diocesan breakouts over the Zoom platform. The link can be found on the Catholic Days participant webpage on our website. And just a couple of reminders about tomorrow's Catholic Days program. Tomorrow, the bishops of Florida will be leading a rosary so we can unite in prayer across the state. We will also be hearing from several of our bishops and presenting the Defensor Vitae Defender of Life Award to Representative Aaron Grawl from the Diocese of Palm Beach. And the pinnacle of Catholic Days, the Red Mass of the Holy Spirit, will be celebrated at 6 p.m. tomorrow evening at the Co-Cathedral of St. Thomas More. It will be live streamed to you from the Co-Cathedral. Bishop William Walk of the Diocese of Pensacola, Tallahassee will preside and preach. We have links to each of these events and we'll be posting this briefing as well, which you may share with friends or review at your leisure. So be ready to switch over to Zoom for today's next segment. And thank you for joining us for this briefing. Now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Bishop John G. Noonan of the Diocese of Orlando. Thank you for joining us on our virtual days at the Capitol. It has been a blessing to have you all with us, but tragically it is not in reality, but we are so glad that you joined us virtually. As we come toward the end of our visit here at the State Capitol, I now ask the Lord to bless us as we finish our day. So let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks, especially for this great nation, for our country, for peace, for hope, for love. We pray too, Lord, for our brothers and sisters in their needs. We pray for our state representatives, that they may truly search for what is right and good for all the citizens of Florida. We pray for our parishioners, our brothers and sisters. We ask Almighty God to bless them. And we pray especially for our church, our bishops, our priests, our sisters, all who serve God with their daily lives. We pray for the CCW, the good work they do here in the state of Florida and in all our parishes and dioceses. And we ask Almighty God in a special way to the intercession of Mary, the mother of God, to bless us and in a special way to bring peace, hope and love into our hearts. I bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you now and forever. Amen. Thank you.